All right. Uh, welcome to the UCF versus Tulane football preview. I I'm Brandon Hillick, publisher of UCFSports.com, and I am privileged and honored today to be joined by Gary Smith of the Wave Report on Rivals, and he also uh, is a Tulane B reporter for uh, the, I guess, the couple newspapers right in town, uh, NOLA.com, and uh, is a New Orleans advocate. Yeah, it, it's it was it was the New Orleans advocate, and then when they bought the Times Picayune, they kind of took over the Times Picayune's name because that's got the cachet in New Orleans. Right, <laughs> everyone knows that name through the years. Yeah. So you've been associated covering, you know, Tulane for a long time. How how far do you go back uh, covering the Green Wave? Well, I covered the game when. Tulane played an Owen, an Owen, a UCF team that went 0 and 12, whatever year that was, 2014, maybe. Okay, that, um, was so that was 15. 15, yeah. So I started yeah. in 2013. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you go back. So you've been there for the entirety mm -hmm. of the Willie Fritz yeah. era. And I guess you were there for what, the tail end of the Superdome days? Yes. And moving yeah. into Yolman Stadium in what, 2014? Correct. And everything. And uh, I mean, we just got to talk about this, you know, right off the bat. I mean, is this. Is this how big is this game to Tulane? I mean, is this the biggest game, at least in a generation, uh, for Tulane football? It is because the the Tulane team that went twelve and zero in nineteen ninety eight, they ended up they didn't play a team that was ranked all year long. They were the dominant team in the conference USA that year, so there was no one game like this. Um, that that team was just good from the start, um, and and they had no real competition. This is obviously a much different situation. So yeah, I, when I did the research and realized they hadn't been ranked place playing a ranked team at home since 1949 that tells you all you <laughs> need that, that that's 73 years so yeah this this is a really big game and it will be really interesting to see if they can get a sellout they had a sellout against memphis for homecoming but homecoming has a built-in audience right uh, people that wouldn't normally be there and that was their first sellout since the very first game in 2014 against georgia tech um so you would think there's no reason for people in New Orleans not to attend this game. It's a, it's a Tulane team in first place playing a UCF team that's probably the most talented team in the league. And if Tulane can win this game, Tulane's almost a lock to make the conference championship game. So, yeah, it, it, I, yeah. I, I, I don't know if it'll be a sellout, but there's a pretty good chance it will be. Yeah, that was my next comment. I, you know, you mentioned 1998 and, and Tommy Bowden being the head coach, Sean King, the quarterback. I know a lot of people remember that undefeated season. It's kind of funny. I think uh, after UCF, claimed a national championship uh oh i mean it's in the record book the Co uh, collie matrix uh after 2017 i i, know, I remember they uh made yeah. some t-shirts uh someone did around too late that proclaimed Tulane the 1998 national <laughs> champions and everything but you know it's it's you know it's been a struggle you know through the years with with Tulane, and, and i think it looked you know this is like you say if Tulane wins this game they're a virtual you know i gotta look at the tiebreakers and stuff but they would have a tiebreaker over ucf they still get to play smu in cincinnati but yeah i would think they have a great chance at that point to make the conference championship Tulane's never really played for a conference championship at least in this conference no. championship game era i know there were there was a three-way tie in 2018 mm -hmm. you've got a five and three record it went went to memphis and and they memphis played ucf in that one but they never really played they i don't know if they've ever really been in the mix this late in the season for a, a conference championship no. at least since this cusa slash aac era but no, no that, that that's correct i mean they that five and three team, and by the way, that was the only Tulane team before this year that did not finish with a losing record in the AAC. The Tulane's best record in any other year was three and five. That team, that team, they played a big game in Houston that year. That if they'd have won that, they probably would have made the conference championship game. But they would have been a massive underdog. Whoever was going to win that division that year, um, it wasn't the same. And then that team just wasn't was not nearly as good. This is a complete football team this year. This, is a, this team is no fluke. Um, we'll find out how good they are on, on Saturday, but, but it's a team that's just light years ahead of, of any team. I, I covered a Tulane bowl team in 2013 in conference USA. This team, that team couldn't hold a candle to, to this team. This, this team's legit. Yeah. So as we get ready for this game, obviously it's a big game in its own right, but it was, it was kind of a downer, I guess on Sunday when ESPN announced that college game day was not going to Tulane. I mean, I thought it was, I mean, I'm sure you agree with me hundred percent. It was a perfect opportunity. Like I said, an unprecedented moment in Tulane football history. First ranked versus ranked games since 1949. They've mm -hmm. never been there. You know, New Orleans yeah. is a, is an awesome city. Uh, I mean, they could have done maybe what, and when they went to Memphis a few years ago, they set up on Bill Street. They could have set up in the French Quarter or yeah. something like that. What an awesome backdrop! I mean, 
it would have been an amazing atmosphere, and yet they chose to go back to Texas. I, I know they're playing TCU. I know TCU is having a great year, but it's not at TCU. So how shocked were you guys? Because I think people on the UCF side thought as long as both of us took care of business over the weekend that it was headed to New Orleans. So yeah. what did you think about that? Yeah, I'm, I, given the results on Saturday, I was shocked because the two game, the two other possibilities that I had written about Illinois, which also has never hosted a college game day. They were 16th in the country. And if they had won and Purdue had won, which looked like it was going to happen because they were both playing at home, then that would have been a game that was kind of the de facto divisional championship in the Big Ten to see who gets crushed by either Ohio State or Michigan in the championship game. So I thought that was a possibility. And then Illinois lost at home and Purdue lost. So that was a totally irrelevant game. And then the other game, Alabama, Ole Miss, kind of the same deal. They've been to Oxford several times. Yeah. But if if Alabama had beaten LSU, that was still a big game. I thought that was the other possibility. Alabama loses to LSU. The deck was cleared. Um, this was from left field, the going back to Texas. And, and they've shown they've gone to program that it's not like they don't go to non right. Five conference. And with the Jackson State right. a few Jackson, weeks ago. With Appalachian State. Appalachian early. State. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, it, it certainly looked like everything was aligned. Uh, for this to happen and it was a curious decision that they I mean I mean UCF thought they might get game day if they hadn't lost to uh, East Carolina I thought maybe right. for the Cincinnati game that was kind of maybe be a farewell for Lee Corso who who lives in this area but you know they UCF lost to ECU so that was out of the picture so right. Uh, obviously, a college football playoff rankings came out earlier this week. I think Tulane is number 17, UCF's 22nd. Mm -hmm. uh, Tulane's 8-1 and one this season, which obviously is remarkable. I think everyone has had a positive impression, and everyone knows Willie Fritz is, is a good coach. But I know last season did not go according to plan, 2-8. and eight. We know there was extenuating circumstances with what Hurricane Ida, Ida that yes. came through New Orleans, uh, what late August, and and they had every you know I know Tulane's been through this before. Mm -hmm. They had to kind of pack up and, and move yeah. up to Birmingham for a few weeks, and I know there was a really tight game. But they almost beat Oklahoma, but after mm -hmm. that, the wheels kind of fell off. So just kind of looking back to last year and just looking at the turnaround this year, what's what's been the biggest difference? You know, why is Tulane so good this year? Well, two things. One, I did not see it coming that Tulane would be this good. So let's start there. I'm not going to pretend like I had Tulane at eight and one going <laughs> into the UCF game. But you can really, you really can throw out last year because it was more, they were displaced by a hurricane for a month. They were getting trained. They, they were having like physical training in bathrooms of the hotel where they were staying at. They had to, they had to do their weightlifting at a high school in burn. If it rained, they had to call Alabama and see if they could travel to Tuscaloosa. To it, was, it was chaos. Yeah. And then when they got back to new Orleans, a lot of the dorms had been robbed. So I mean, it was just, it was a nightmare. But having said that skip last year, the previous three years, Tulane went to bowl games, but it was a seven and five, six and six type of outfit. It wasn't an eight and one deal I, I, I use three words for the for the for the turnaround one was retention usually when you go two and ten you lose a bunch of guys in the transfer portal era Tulane lost exactly one starter and that was Jeffrey Johnson who'd been a four-year starter who went to Oklahoma he's, he's probably doing pretty well in nil on, on that front <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> other than that yeah. he's probably regretting that decision um, they're not they're not looking so hot yeah yeah um and and that was it because the culture they they really believed that they would have had a good year last year with the players. Yeah. That were returning is, is that, I mean, is, is that really why you think that is? It's just the culture and the coaching staff and the chemistry and the fact that, I mean, I, I don't know much about Tulane, but I'm assuming a lot of guys, you know, they want, they go to Tulane because they want to go to Tulane university, that it's a great academic institution and they're not going to take it lightly just to jump ship and go to another school. So, so why do you think, yeah. what are some of the reasons why you think they didn't lose anybody? That, that was correct. And then, and, and main, their team leaders, their four um, co-captains from last year, they didn't even bother having a vote this year. They just kept the, the same four guys. Again, that's saying a lot when you went two and 10, but as Willie Fritz says many times, he had no problems on the team last year, other than performance on the field. Um, but yeah, Michael Pratt loves Tulane. He, he wasn't leaving. He would have been a guy that definitely could have gone somewhere else. And then there are two linebackers who are really the heart of the defense, um, Nick Anderson and Dorian Williams. Dorian Williams, I think College Football Weekly picked him as the preseason American Athletic Conference Defensive Player of the Year last year, going into the year off based off his sophomore year. Um, like everybody else, he didn't quite have the same year. Right. He, he's playing at that level this year. He, he had no, that um, Nick Anderson loves Tulane. He had no interest in, in, in leaving. He's another terrific player. So when you're, when your team leaders are in that much invested and are that much convinced that you're going to do well, 
Um, that makes a difference. The very first press conference this year, Nick Anderson gets up and he's asked, what does he think is going to be the big storyline this year? And he says, we're going to break the internet. We're going to win the American athletic conference. I didn't even run the quote because I thought <laughs> that wasn't realistic at, at the time. Yeah. And he, they say a lot in August, but he, exactly. These guys believed it. And, 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 and so far they put themselves in a position where they have a chance to deliver <laughs> on yeah. that proclamation. But that, that was it. But then there's one other thing. This isn't the same team as last year because they, they got 10 players from the transfer portal. Yeah, you talk, I was just reading one of your stories yeah. and you said not only was the portal great in terms of not losing anyone, but they added a bunch of impact guys, right? And they've had a checkered history on transfer portal guys under, under Willie Fritz. He's not a real big believer in it. And they've kind of been 50-50 on whether guys were good. They went 10 for 10 this year. I mean, all 10 guys have been one of them, Kane and Ray, one of their starting guards who transferred from Colorado is out for the year with a season with a season in the injury. The other nine guys are all major contributors for this team. And, and, and just some of the best guys on, on, on the team. Um, they, they, and some of them were a huge surprise. I mean, they got a guy, Lawrence Keyes came from Notre Dame. He's a New Orleans guy. He was a big recruit coming out of high school. Day Day McDougal came from Maryland. He was a teammate of Michael Pratt's in high school. They were best okay. friends. That made sense. It's not a surprise that they've they've been good. But one of Tulane's cornerbacks, Jarius Monroe, went to play at Nickel State in Louisiana the last couple of years. He transferred in, um, was a key backup this year. And then Jaden Candy, one of their best cornerbacks, had a season-ending injury two two games ago. And Jarius Monroe stepped in and played an unbelievable game. Um, yeah. On yeah. I was, was, was that the player? I think he was uh, – I was watching some of the interviews posted yesterday. Was he the one who had an older brother that played at Tulane yes. a few he, years ago? I was watching that, and he was just so excited that he was at Tulane. I mean, he yeah. was just gushing about it. I mean, yeah. it just made you want to be a – yeah. Yeah, and then they've got Patrick Jenkins on the defensive line. He, he transferred from TCU. He's another local guy. He's the best – he replaced Jeffrey Johnson and maybe even a better player than Jeffrey Johnson, who was a very good, good player. Um, he, he's, he's been terrific um, at, at defensive tackle. So you, you get all these guys. They've got another guy, Prince Pines. He started his career at Baylor, transferred to Sam Houston State, started like 21 games in one year because of the FCS. Played right, two the, the two, year, two seasons in one calendar. I'm and not going to Like 335 pounds. I thought there's no way this guy can play. It turns out it's he's not really overweight. He's just a big dude. He's <laughs> an anchor on the offensive line. Um, and then – a running back, Shoddy Clayton Johnson, who was the, he was the one guy that didn't contribute in the first half of the season. He was a huge local product, went to Colorado, did nothing. He's come on. He had an absolutely fantastic game against Tulsa, ran for over 100 yards on 14 carries. Um, he, he gives them an, a, a really elite running back. This, this is the kind of stuff that hadn't happened before. So they had a lot of returning starters, a lot more than you would think of a two and 10 team and not even just one year starters, two year returning starters. And then you add 10 guys. Yeah. It's just, it's not the same team in any way, shape or form. Yeah. We, I guess when you look at, at Willie Fritz, head coach at Tulane, I mean, clearly the best coach Tulane's had, I mean, Tommy mm -hmm. Bowden was barely at, at yeah. Tulane. So I don't yeah. know how you evaluate it, right. but definitely best since mm -hmm. that era. Uh, I think he was highly regarded coming in. He came from Georgia Southern, one of those yeah. schools that kind of is known for, option football and and i know he, he tried to do more of that right when he first got to tulane and he's kind of quietly pivoted away as kind of mm -hmm. is he more of just a, a program ceo these days and kind of you know relinquishing you know offensive coordinator duties uh he's always, he's always been more of a defensive coach anyway he, he okay. is a defensive coach so he, okay he believe now and and in georgia southern he is more he always had a spread option one of those deals where you they always had at sam houston state they had three wide receivers on the field at all the time spread the field out and then ran the option it wasn't okay, okay. Through the center but when he went to georgia southern that's what they had already he still kept the the, the shotgun for poor part of it but they really ran a true triple option there he wasn't a true triple option guy but he was definitely an option heavy quarterback run a lot passing game very, very simple <laughs> um, okay. based on getting guys to bunch of guys in the box and then throwing over their heads. He realized after three years, he realized that after Tulane went to a bowl game in his third year, he they, they had a dramatic win over Navy where they blew a 21 to nothing lead in the second half, then scored in the last minute, went for two and got it and won to get to a bowl game. He fired his offensive coordinator the next week um, off of and and he could have given him a raise and people would have been OK because Tulane yeah. like, at that time hadn't gone to many bowl games but he had understood at that point that that system a it wasn't going to recruit well enough to sustain the level he yeah. wanted and two that it it just 
with the caliber of players in the American Athletic Conference, it just wasn't working quite as well as, as he, he knew he needed to have a balanced offense. And that that changed everything. He never he never really he never really talked about it. He, he acted like the in fact, I remember the first year he hired Will Hall as offense coordinator. He still acted like the option was a major part of his offense. And right. The team prepare for it. And you were watching the offense like, well, where is it? <laughs> um, <laughs> so. And instead, and, and then when Will Hall left, he, he he's, he's he's kept that. He's now on his second offensive coordinator since Will Hall left, and it's it doesn't yeah you know, they they it's a it's a spread attack. Your a lot of RPOs, your stuff. Your it's your typical college offense now. Yeah. So Will Hall is I guess he what left Tulane a couple years ago, right? And is now yeah. I think in his second year at Southern right. Miss. And when you look at at the schedule, and, and who knows yeah. where Tulane would be ranked if they hadn't yeah. dropped that one, but they actually lost. Yeah. An early season game to Southern Miss, uh, a home game at Ullman yeah. Stadium. What what happened that that day? Uh, you know, a couple of things. Will Hall's a really good coach. He knows yeah. the Tulane players. He was really motivated for that game. They have a great relationship, but he wanted to come back and beat his, <laughs> his old boss. But Tulane had just beaten Kansas State. It was yeah. the first time that Will that Willie Fritz had ever beaten a Power Five conference team in his coaching career, wherever he had been. And the players got a little too full of themselves off of that one because they really played well in that game. Kansas State's a good team and yeah. it was a close game, but Tulane looked I went to the game. Tulane looked like the better team that day. They could have lost, but they it was no fluky thing. They got overconfident and then they get a good Southern Miss the first two times Tulane has the ball, touchdown, touchdown. The first two times Southern Miss has the ball three and out, three and out. Tulane's up 14 nothing. They think the game's over. Then Southern Miss scored and it was almost like the Tulane players, they weren't ready emotionally to yeah. have a game. They just weren't. They thought it was over. They were relaxed, and they couldn't get back into game mode. Southern Miss has a pretty good defense. Their offense, not good, um, but their defense is solid. And Tulane just didn't have a didn't have a good good night. D- just couldn't get back into the flow. Um, had two kicks blocked. And usually, when you lose a game like that, that a punt block that set up a touchdown, a field goal block, all the st- a pick six um, that Michael Pratt threw an interception that was the game decider in the fourth quarter. He didn't throw another interception until the second quarter against Tulsa this, this last week. So a lot of stuff happened. And, uh, and, and that was the result. I'm still not sure. Tulane might not have beaten Houston the next week though, if they'd have beaten Southern Miss, because that was a huge wake up call. And then they go to Houston and they, Michael Pratt's out with an injury, which they kept hidden. I'm, practice is still open to reporters. Really? They, they yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't know anything about that. Yeah, <laughs> with UC, I haven't seen nothing. Fun. It was an early game against Houston in the week, so there were there was only two practices open, and one they said they were practicing in an indoor facility at the Saints, and they practiced outdoors, so I didn't go to that one. So I had one practice to notice that Michael Pratt wasn't out there, and 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 I got there, and it was the third, it was the game, it, it was the last practice of the week before the game, and a lot of times they rest quarterback, so I had no idea. That he was. <laughs> And, and and then their 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 backup and that was a big game because I, I that's what I thought that was an overtime game when yeah, Tulane no, won twenty seven twenty four. Justin Ibietta goes out on the first series. He he separates he, um he, he, a shoulder, and so then they're down to their third string quarterback who luckily had started against Cincinnati last year, and it, so he'd actually been under the spotlight. Um and he played a great game. Not I, I think Tulane would have won more easily if they if Pratt had played. Yeah. But the guy made some clutch throws. It goes to overtime. He he throws the winning touchdown, and and, and it really they were so angry. They were just livid after the they embarrassed after the the Southern Miss game. I'm not sure that they were would have been as emotionally ready to, to win that Houston game. And that was the key game. Obviously, if they had not won that Houston game, everything would be would be different now. Yeah. So yeah. Obviously, this is kind of, I guess, the meat. That was a big game, obviously, beating Houston. This is really the meat of Tulane's schedule yes. coming up. They, they got to beat UCF. They got SMU, who, what was it, like 76 to 60? Whatever that score was the <laughs> last Willie week. never was... beaten in, in, in the American Athletic Conference, by the way. Oh, Willie Fritz is 0-6 against SMU. Okay, so, and that's yeah. uh, that's next week. Actually, that's a, that's a short week, was, too. Yeah. That's a short week after UCF and then – yeah. Ending the season uh, Black Friday, I believe, against mm-hmm. on the road at right. Cincinnati. So this is this is the do or die time for mm-hmm. for Tulane. But let's let's talk a little bit about Michael Pratt for a moment. Uh, I know he was a, what a, he's a Deerfield Beach, Florida native, so he's from the yeah. state of Florida. Comes mm-hmm. in as a true freshman in 2020, which you know I'm not really sure what the timelines worked out, but with COVID and everything else, you know sometimes players they weren't reporting as early as they would have been. Maybe they wouldn't have been as I don't know. Was he a spring guy? But then most yeah, teams didn't have spring, spring practice. Yeah, did. Most teams got spring practice canceled. So the yeah. fact that he came in and, and did he did he earn the starting job for the most part right out of the bat or did no, some circumstances did happen where you know he yeah. ended up starting most they, of the games? They had another quarterback. I'm blanking out his name. He was a Southern Miss transfer 
who clearly won the job. And Pratt came in. He was since in the spring, few spring practices they had in the COVID year. He was, he looked really good. But once the fall practice started, he struggled. <laughs> um, he looked like a true freshman quarterback. Yeah. And, and he, um, but they, they, uh, they went to South Alabama in their opener, barely won. We're losing the whole game. And then they're playing Navy, a terrible Navy team, one of the worst Navy teams ever. We're up 24 to nothing late in the second quarter and somehow managed to blow a 24 nothing lead at home to Navy on ABC and, and lose the game. Then the next week when the, when the quarterback threw a couple of picks against Southern Miss in the first quarter, Pratt came in until it ended up winning like 64 to 21 okay. or something like that. And that was, that was how he became the starting quarterback. And uh, yeah, he, he, he looked good. He's just one of those guys. He's a, he, he's a gamer. He, he, I mean, he had not practiced well in that preseason, but the second yeah. the, the lights went on, he, he, he played a lot better and you could tell immediately he has all the leadership qualities. He has players love playing with him. Um, he, he, he pumps everybody up. You can tell the difference the, the, the second he came in in that, that first game in his, yeah. his first year. I know he's had some shoulder issues maybe mm-hmm. you know, for the past couple of years, but you know, junior season, this season, Michael Price, it seems like he's really elevated his game. Yeah. Like, what differences are you seeing? Because, you know, no one, like you said, no one really was predicting this sort of turnaround for Tulane this year. But I feel a big reason is the play of yeah. Michael Pratt and how much he's improved. What are, what's what's different about him this year? It just, is, he's just, um, he, one, he's up last year. He took some hellacious hits against Oklahoma in the opener. Um, which was supposed to be a two-lane home game. That was part right. Of I remember that. That was so was depressing because it was going to be the biggest home camp. game ever. Then they go to Oklahoma, almost beat them, but then they have to play Ole Miss a couple of weeks later. And that's and Oklahoma had a ballyhooed quarterback who's no good, who's now at South Carolina, <laughs> Spencer Rattler. Uh, Ole Miss quarterback, too good. And Tulane, yeah. it, and Corral. it was the end of Tulane's month-long stay in Birmingham. It was they they got embarrassed, but what on his last play of that game, Pratt hurt his shoulder and played through an injury all year long. His strength is not as his arm strength is not his biggest strength. He, it's good enough, but it's, he doesn't have a huge arm and the rest of the year he had a poor arm and you um, yeah. and he just, he just didn't play very well. He, he just couldn't make, he couldn't make the throws he wanted to. And even worse, when you have that shoulder injury, he thought he was making the right throw and it would come up short and, and, and get picked sometimes. And he, he showed how tough he was, but he, maybe shouldn't have played as much as he he, he did last year uh, in the off season. He gained about 15, 20 pounds, got a lot stronger. And this year is the natural progression that you'll see from him when he's healthy. He, he, he got hurt against Southern miss too, at some point and missed the Houston game. And it was like, is this going to happen again? Yeah. Since then is when he's really come on. He, he had three spectacular games in a row um, against uh, Memphis, East Carolina and South Florida. Um, he, he's now he he's on pace to have the second highest efficiency rating in the history of Tulane at quarterback behind Sean King in that 1990. Okay. He's not that far behind him. He, yeah, he, he looks like a third year starting quarterback now. He, he can do it all. He's a really good runner, too. Um, and, uh, in, in the RPOs they run, he's gotten really good at knowing at reading the defense and knowing when he should fake the handoff and, and, and run. And, and 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 he also has much better receivers than he did last year. I mentioned they had Lawrence Keyes, a receiver from Notre Dame is now playing for Tulane day, day McDougal receiver in Maryland. They were much higher recruits than the receivers that Tulane. Usually yeah. The program. yeah. I was going to ask you in a moment about a receiver. Tell yeah. me about that position because I'm just looking at the stat sheet and, and I mean, all the stats are almost identical. Among, I think seven players have double digit receptions and maybe the top yeah. six are within one or two uh-huh. of each other reception wise. Who, who is maybe the number one, is there a number one receiver yeah, in that it? group? And, and how, no. how deep is that? It's, it's very deep and it's amazing. Cause I think last year Tulane had two receivers with, 20 catches at the end of the year after, yeah. after, after 12 games at times last year, I felt like Tulane had the worst FBS receivers in the country in terms of performance. They, they didn't get open and they didn't catch the ball. That's, that's a problem. <laughs> Both of those things. <laughs> they, did. Um, they brought most of those guys back. And then I think bringing in McDougal and keys just kind of um, galvanized everybody better. They also, their longtime receivers coach retired. They brought in a receivers coach who was actually a head coach in division two and had been an offensive coordinator. They brought in an offensive coordinator from central Missouri. Uh, and then they brought in, um, I mean, who had been the head coach at central Missouri. They made him their offensive coordinator and they made his former offensive coordinator who would become a head coach at another school in division two, the wide receivers coach. They've meshed perfectly and you can, the wide receivers just, they're, they're playing at a, at a different level now. I don't, there really is, 
I think their best receiver is actually their tight end, Tyreek James. Okay. Um, he had a couple of drops against Tulsa, but he he gets open and he gets open deep. He he's a, he's a, he can run those deep seam routes for 20, 25 yards down the field. The wide receivers are almost interchangeable. You never know from from game to game which guy is is, is going to step up. None of them, I would say, are spectacular, but all of them are capable of, of making big plays. I, I really can't pick out one. Yeah, tell me a little bit about uh, running back Ty J Spears. Uh, I guess you could probably make the argument he's you know could be the best running back in the league in the yeah. American. I think stat wise he's behind uh, Keaton Mitchell at East Carolina. Mm-hmm. But you know what makes Spears such a great running back? He's unbelievable. He, he's one of the best running backs I've ever seen. The only thing that's kept him back is injuries. He in that Southern Miss game two years ago he tore his ACL and it was a bad ACL tear. And so he's, he's, he's coming off that. Okay. Yeah, Cause UCF has a R- RJ now. Harvey's they yeah. have a running back the same way coming yeah. off of ACL uh, last year, the first half of the year, he didn't do much. And he, he even talked about, he, he considered quitting football cause he just, it was so frustrating for him. He couldn't do what he wanted to do. He got better as last year went along, ended the year with a, what a 264 yard output against, against Memphis. And that let him know that, that he was, he was back. Um, they've kind of held them. They don't give them the ball a lot and they're really trying to limit the wear and tear on, on him. Cause he, he's also had some hamstring issues and, and other things like that, but he, he, he's the whole package. He, he can run inside. He can run outside. He, he can, he's a breakaway back. He's got, he, he anticipates the hole incredibly well. He, he, he's unbelievably good. Um, and, and, uh, no matter how many times he had, well, he had against Tulsa, which does have a horrible run defense, but he had 14 yeah. carries for 150 yards. Hurt his hamstring a little bit in the second half against Tulsa. They didn't need him the rest of the game. He came back for one play, gained 12 yards, and then they took him out to make sure. Yeah, because I'm looking right now. He's coming off three consecutive yeah. games uh, yeah. going back to October 15th at yeah. USF, 151 mm-hmm. yards uh, against Memphis, 125 yards. And this past week against Tulsa, 157 yeah. yards. He's really good. I mean, Tulane's had some good running backs under Willie Fritz. A couple of them, Dondre- Dontrell Hilliard is still in the NFL. He has the unfortunate deal of being the backup at Tennessee at <laughs> the Titans, you don't yeah, get on the yeah. a whole lot. But they they've had some other running backs have a cup of coffee in the NFL. None of them are anywhere near as good as Tajay Spears. He's yeah he's, let's, let's talk a little bit about Tulane's defense. Uh it's the best scoring defense in the American uh giving up only uh, 16.9 points per game. UCF is second in that quarter category. Tulane is number one as well in total defense, giving up 307.3 yards per game. Uh it seems like it's a um my bad. I had a uh, had an yeah. audio go off for a minute. Uh, but uh, but the linebackers, which we talked about yeah. uh, a moment ago, you were named dropping Nick Anderson and Dorian Williams. Is that yeah. when you talk about defense and the leadership and, and kind of the the superstars on defense? Does it start at that li- at linebacker yeah. position? Those two guys. Dorian Williams is going to be in the NFL. Um, he doesn't. He may his size may not be ideal for the NFL, but he he's a sideline to sideline player who can those. Um, against Memphis, there was one play where he dropped back in coverage 30 yards and almost intercepted the pass. And then on the next play, he blitzed and and forced the quarterback and hit the quarterback as he was throwing the ball. He he can do it all. And Nick Anderson, pretty much the same exact player, just a little bit smaller. <laughs> um, yeah. And and they've been they've been lethal this year. And and they also they play hard on every down. Like Willie Fritz says, everybody thinks they play hard. Those two guys really do play hard on 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 every down. And and they're they're the leaders on the defense, but there's experience all over the place. Um, yeah, Nathan yeah. Clark, three year starter. He's their nickelback. He played nickelback two years ago, moved to safety last year. He's back to nickelback this year. Um, they brought in another another one of the transfer portal guys. Lummy Young had tons of starting experience at Duke. His his coming in allowed them to move making Clark to nickelback, which is really his his best spot. Larry Brooks two years ago. Um, three years ago when Tulane played in a bowl game back in his hometown in Fort Worth, or two, he, he looked like he was going to be an all conference player down the road. He had injury problems last year. He's still in, in, in the lineup. Um, and then Darius Hodges on the, on their rush end led the conference last year in tackles for loss. Hasn't quite had the same season last year, but he's still applying a lot of, a lot of pressure. Um, just they for, again, for a team that went two and 10 last year, they have a ton of experience on defense and that's, that's, one reason the defense has been so good this year. What are your What are your keys to this Saturday's game? Uh, obviously, two lanes on a roll, but uh, for them to continue this this uh, this roll they're on and to kind of on, continue their march, I guess, towards the conference championship game. What do you want to see from the Green Wave on Saturday? I want to see the offense. The offensive line needs to 
hold its own or win the battle against US, UCF's defensive front because UCF has some dudes on <laughs> on defense. I know they don't have their sack total isn't that that big. Yeah, they. I, I was kind of an enigma last week. Uh, yeah. Memphis had one of the worst, um, you know, protecting yeah. Seth Hennigan, but yeah. they weren't able really to pressure him yeah. very much last week. So we're kind. Of, UCF yeah. people are kind of wondering what what yeah. defensive uh, pass yeah. rush we're going to see. That lineup. Tulane also early in the year, as well as Tulane's been playing, they were struggling to run them there until this last week against Tulsa. Tulane had the lowest rushing totals of the Willie Fritz era and not anymore. You play Tulsa, your numbers go way up. That's kind of the way it works on, on <laughs> um, ran for over 300 yards, but it's just good. Will they be able to create space for the running backs to make their big plays? Cause it's not this, this guy I mentioned, their transfer from Colorado, Shoddy Clayton Johnson. He's a big time player too. Um, they've got a third guy, Iverson Celestine. He's pretty good too. And they, they rotate all those guys in, but there has to be some space for them to, to have their, will they be able to create that against a UCF team that has just better players than a lot of the teams Tulane has played remains to be seen. And then protecting Pratt. There've been times this year where he's been hit a lot, not every week. Um, and, 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 and so I, I do, I, if, if those two things happen, I like Tulane's chances to win. If, if UCF dominates up front, obviously it's tough to, to, to win when that's happening. Yeah, a, a couple of final questions before we uh, we let you go. But uh, I, I got to feel like you know, UCF fans, uh, I know they we, we had a similar situation. You know, we were playing at the Citrus Bowl. UCF was playing at the Citrus Bowl for years and years. We we're finally able to get an on-campus stadium. And mm-hmm. if you ask me or really anyone else who's been around for any number of years, I think that was the biggest turning point for UCS program was going on campus. So as someone, I know you were around a little bit in those, those mm-hmm. Superdome days. And what has Yeoman Stadium done for, for Tulane and just maybe just, you know, the alumni and, and recruiting. And, and it's really, it's a true home field, which I guess maybe you didn't have before. What is, what has Yeoman Stadium done for Tulane football? We're about to find out because there really wasn't <laughs> the look. East Carolina, just two home games ago. This, okay, the students were out of town on. Okay, you said it was fall on, break on, or break. something. Yeah, thirteen thousand at, at the stadium, um, and Tulane was already having a successful year at that point. So they, we really haven't seen that great atmosphere at the stadium. But speaking personally, when I covered the team at the dome, it was one of the most miserable experiences <laughs> of my, my life. I spent. From 1991 to 2007, I covered University of Florida football. Went to went to every game, and then I started covering Tulane, and it was a morgue. I mean, even the year when they went to the bowl game in 2013, it was just there was no energy. It was just it was it was, in my opinion, awful. There's some debates about that. There's some people who feel like they should have built an indoor practice facility to keep up with the in the facility yeah. with, those, with teams. But I love the on-campus stadium. It creates an atmosphere. The students have started coming to games this year. That's been a problem in the past, and I think. If they build on what they've done this year, you're going to really see that true. true my UCF, I mean, it's an awesome atmosphere at UCF now for 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 home games. And if Tulane can build on what they've done this year, I think you'll start seeing a similar thing at a at a smaller stadium, which is which is good. It's the right size stadium, I think, for for yeah. what the program is. Yeah. We'll see how many UCF fans make the trip. I know it's going to be the most popular road trip destination. You know, mm-hmm. as you know, we're kind of dealing with this tropical storm yeah. slash hurricane this week, and and a lot of people's travel plans, and they were flying out Thursday. Maybe they're all getting <laughs> airports are shut down. Yeah. So we'll see. I, I don't know. Uh, hopefully, I can get there. I might have to make a last minute decision to drive, but I, I know I, there should be a few thousand UCF fans in the stands on Saturday. I, hope, hopefully, some, yeah. As someone who made the drive from Gainesville to New Orleans about fifty times over the years, it's a couple hours longer from. I know that panhandle. I'll tell you, yeah, there's, there's, there's nothing to see in that panhandle drive. is brutal. It is. It is, it is rough. You don't have last to worry thing. About, You don't have to worry about directions though. <laughs> Just keep on going straight. Exactly. Yeah. Last thing. Uh, I know everyone that hits up uh, New Orleans. They're they're excited about the the culinary scene and and you know. Uh, French court and all that stuff. As someone who's been a local now for a few years, do you have any any maybe like food recommendations maybe off the beaten path i mean everyone knows about cafe du monde and all these you know tourist trap places but you know i imagine you probably live you know maybe closer to tulane you're not Mm -hmm. i assume you don't live down in the french quarter but is there any is there any any places that you know maybe off the radar a little bit Mm -hmm. that you know that you would you would recommend to to maybe grab dinner or lunch there are so many off the radar places and this first of all you can't go wrong in the city like exactly even if it's a place that i am not that familiar with if I, 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 the food's good everywhere. I, I would, I would definitely recommend getting a po' boy. Um, they're similar to subs, but better. Um, 
there's uh, there's a lot of different places that you, there's a place called Parkway Bakery. If you want, that's 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 near where I live. Actually, that that would be the place I would recommend um, as an off the the, the beaten path place. And and uh, you can, they've got great shrimp po a shrimp po boy at, at Parkway Bakery might be the way to go. Okay, maybe I'll have to check that out whenever I was gonna get there on Thursday afternoon, right. but I don't know. I don't it might know be now. Saturday at noon. <laughs> I maybe maybe coming in right before kickoff. I don't know. Well, I really appreciated it, Gary. This was a great conversation. Learning more about Tulane. Uh, I'm excited for for Tulane. This is a, a big game for for both schools and just knowing what Tulane's gone through, you know, through the years and everything. I'm just I'm just mm -hmm. happy to see them having having success. And uh, yeah. thank you very much for joining me. And hopefully hopefully I'll see you in the press box on Saturday. Okay, see you there. Thanks. Hope you I make it. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. All right. Take care.